Chapter 11 of Badge of Infamy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Badge of Infamy by Lester Del Rey. Read by Stephen H. Wilson of Prometheus Radio Theater. www.prometheusradiotheater.com Eleven, Convert Feldman fought for control of himself, forced himself to think, to hold on to his sanity. It was sheer stupidity since nothing could have been more merciful than to lose this reality. But the will to be himself was stronger than logic. And bit by bit, he forced the fear and horror away from him until he could examine his situation. He was spinning slowly so that stars ahead of him seemed to crawl across his view. The ship was retreating from him already hundreds of yards away. Mars was a shrunken pill far away. Then something blinked to one side. He turned his head to stare. A little ship was less than three hundred yards away. He recognized it as a life raft. Now his spin brought him around to face it, and he saw it was paralleling his course. The ejection of the life raft must have caused the thump he heard before he was cast adrift. It meant someone was trying to save him. It meant life. He flailed his arms and beat his legs together, senselessly trying to force himself closer while trying to guess who could have taken the chance. No one he could think of could have booked passage on the Iroquois. There wasn't that much free money in the villages. Something flashed a hot blue, and the little ship leaped forward. Whoever was handling it knew nothing about piloting. It picked up too much speed at too great an angle. Again, blue spurts came, but this time matters were even worse. Then there was a long wait before a third try was made. He estimated the course. It would miss him by a good hundred feet, but it was probably the best the amateur pilot could do. The ship drifted closer, but to one side. It would soon pass him completely. A space-suited figure suddenly appeared in the tiny airlock, holding a coil of rope. The rope shot out, well thrown, but it was too short. It would pass within ten feet, and might as well have been ten miles for all the good it would do him. Every film he had seen on space seemed to form a mad jumble in his mind, but he seized on the first idea he could remember. He inhaled deeply and yanked the oxygen tank free. An automatic seal on the suit cut off the connection. He aimed the hissing bottle, fumbling for the manual valve. It almost worked. It kicked him toward the rope slightly, but most of the energy was wasted in setting him into a wilder spin. He blinked, trying to spot the rope. It was within five feet now. Again, he waited until he seemed to be in position. This time, he threw the bottle away from it. It added spin to his vertical axis, but the rope came into view within arm's reach. He grasped it, just as his lungs seemed about to burst. He couldn't hold on long enough to tie the rope. His lungs gave up suddenly, collapsing and then sucking in greedily. Clean air rushed in, letting his head clear. He'd forgotten that the inflated suit held enough oxygen for several minutes. His body struck the edge of the airlock, and a hand jerked him inside. The outer seal was slammed shut and locked, and there was a hiss of air entering. He threw back his helmet just as Chris Ryan jerked hers off. Her voice shook almost hysterically. Thank God, Dan. I almost gave up. I liked the air out there better, he told her bitterly. If you'll open the lock again, I'll leave. Or am I supposed to believe this is rescue and that you just came along to save me? I came along to see you killed, as you know very well. Saving you wasn't in my orders. He grunted and reached for the handle that would release the outer lock. Better get back inside if you don't want to blow out with me. It's up to you, Dan, she told him, and there was all the sincerity in the world in her blue eyes. I'm on your side now. He began counting on his fingers. Let's see. The spare battery, the delay in arresting me, the choice of Matthews. It was all true. Anger began to grow in her eyes. Dan Feldman, you get inside this raft. If you don't care about me, you might consider the people dying of the plague who need you. She'd played her trump, 
and it took the round. He followed her. All right, he said grudgingly. Spill your story. She held out a copy of a space radiogram, addressed to Mrs. D. E. Everts, and signed by one of the best doctors on the lobby board of directors. Regret confirmed diagnosis. Top secret. Repeat, top secret. Martian fever incubates 14 years, believed highly fatal. No cure. Research beginning immediately. Penalty violation, top secret. Death, all concerned. Mrs. Everts rates a top secret break. Doc commented dryly. Come off it, Chris. She's the daughter of Elmers of Space Lobby, Chris answered. She pointed to the message, underlining words with her finger. Fourteen years. You couldn't have caused it. Highly fatal, and people are being told it's only a skin disease. Research beginning, but you've already done most of the research. I can see that now. I can see a lot of things. You've got me beat, then, he said. I can't see how such a reformed young noblewoman calmly walked over and stole a life raft. I can't see how your brilliant mind concocted this whole scheme in almost no time. And to be honest, I can't even see why Medical Lobby decided to save me at the last minute and sent you to do the job. You didn't have to spy out knowledge from me. I've been trying all along to get it to your research division. She sighed and dropped onto a little seat. I can't prove my motives. You'll just have to believe me. But it wasn't hard to do what I've done. That shuttle pilot was found in a routine check, stowed away on the life raft. I was with Captain Everts when he was found, so I discovered how to get into the raft. And I heard his whole confession. He wasn't the real pilot. He'd come from the villages to save you. The whole scheme was his. I just used it, hoping I could reach you. As always, her story had a convincing element she shouldn't have known. The pilot's farewell addressing him as Dr. Feldman, had been too low for her to hear, but it was something that fitted her story. It was probably a deliberate clue to give him hope, to assure him the villages were still trying. It shook his confidence. And your motive? Your real motive? he insisted. She swore at him, then began ripping off the spacesuit. She turned her back, pulling a thin blouse down from her neck. He stared, then reached out to touch the lump there. So you've had Selznick's migraine, and you know you're carrying the plague, and you've decided your precious lobby won't save you. She dropped her eyes, then raised them to meet his defiantly. I'm not just scared and selfish. Dad caught it, too, and it must be close to the time for him. He switched to Mars Normal when he was a liaison agent and never changed back. Dan, are we all going to have to die? Can't you save him? Feldman was out of his suit, and at the control panel. There was a manual lever which Chris must have used before. It might work out here where there was room to maneuver and nothing to hit, but trying to make a landing was going to be different. Dan, she repeated. He shrugged. I don't know. They've started research too late, and they'll be under so much pressure that the real brains won't have a chance. The top secret stuff looks bad for research. Maybe there's a cure. It works in culture bottles, but it may fail in person. When I'm convinced I'm safe with you, I may tell you about it. Oh. Her voice was low. Then she sighed. I suppose I can understand why you hate me, Dan. I don't hate you. I'm too mixed up. Tomorrow, maybe. But not now. Shut up and let me see if I can figure out how to land this thing. He found that the fuel tanks were nearly full, but that still didn't leave much margin. Mars must have been notified by Everts and be ready to pick up the craft. He had to reach the wastelands away from any of the shuttle ports. They had no aspirators, however, and they couldn't cover much territory in the spacesuits they would have to use. It meant he'd have to land close to a village where he was known. He jockeyed the ship around by trial and error, studying the manual that was lying prominently on the control panel. According to the booklet, the ship was simple to operate. It was self-leveling in an atmosphere, and automatic flare computers were supposed to make it possible for an amateur to judge the rate of descent near the surface. It looked reassuring, and was probably written with that in mind. Finally, he reached for the control, hoping he'd figured his landing orbit reasonably well by simple logic. He smoothed it out in the following hours as he watched the markings on Mars. When they were near turnover point, he began cranking the little gyroscope to swing the ship. It saved fuel to turn without power, and he wasn't sure he could have turned accurately by blasting. He was gaining some proficiency, however, he felt. 
But now he had to waste fuel and ruin his orbit again. There was no way to practice maneuvering without actually doing so. In the end, he compromised, leaving a small margin for a bad landing that would require a second attempt, but with less practice than he wanted. He had located Jake's village through the little telescope when he finally reached for the main blast control. The thin haze of Mars's atmosphere came rushing up while the blast lashed out. Then they were in the outer fringes of the sky and the blast was beginning to show a corona that ruined visibility. He turned to the flare computer and back to what he could see through the quartz viewport. He was going to land about a half mile from the village, as nearly as he could judge. The computer seemed to work as it should. The speed was within acceptable limits. He gave up trying to see the ground and was forced to trust the machinery designed for amateur pilots. The flare bloomed and he yanked down on the little lever. It could have been worse. They hit the ground, bounced twice, and turned over. The ship was a mess when Feldman freed himself from the elastic straps of the seat. Chris had shrieked as they hit, but she was unbuckling herself now. He threw her her spacesuit and one of the emergency bottles of oxygen from the rack. Hurry up with that. We've sprung a leak, and the pressure's dropping. They were halfway to the village when a dozen tractors came racing up, and Jake piled out of the lead one to drag the two in with him. Heard about it from the broadcasts and figured you might land around here. Good to see you, Doc. He started the tractor off at full speed back to the wastelands, while Doc stared at the armed men who were riding the tractors. Jake caught his look and nodded. You're in enemy territory, Doc. There's a war going on. End recording.